right. Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Seth Lewis, and on behalf of Harvard University Division of Science, Harvard Library, and the Harvard Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series. I'm thrilled to introduce this virtual event with Phil Plate, who is presenting his new book, Under Alien Skies, A Sightseer's Guide to the Universe. Joining him tonight in conversation is fellow astronomer and TED fellow Jesse Christians. Interestingly enough, tonight is not the first time our two speakers have shared the stage. In addition to the general overlap of their scholarship, Platon Christensen both appeared together in a 2017 panel at the annual Star Trek convention, joining forces to take their audience on a science trek through the universe. And tonight, as they explore and converse about Plate's book, they will take us on a virtual trek of our own. Before we move forward, just a few housekeeping things to address. Next month, our final book talk of the academic semester will take place on May 3rd at 6 p.m., Chris Wiggins and Matthew L. Jones discuss their recent book, How Data Happened, A History from the Age of Reason to the Age of Algorithms. To stay up to date on all things Harvard Science Book Talks, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter, and check out our YouTube channel for the latest videos. When tonight's talk begins, I'll place a link in the chat to purchase Under Alien Skies from the Harvard Bookstore. The format of our event is generally 40 to 45 minutes of conversation, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. If at any point you think of a question for our authors, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many of your questions as time allows. Lastly, thank you to our partners at Harvard Bookstore and thank you all for showing up tonight in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and of course, science. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Phil Plate is an astronomer, sci-fi dork, TV documentary talking head, and all-around science enthusiast. The author of Bad Astronomy and Death from the Skies, Plate writes the Bad Astronomy newsletter and lives in Colorado. Joining him in conversation is Dr. Jesse Christensen. Christensen is an astrophysicist with the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute at Caltech, where she searches for, characterizes, and catalogs planets orbiting other stars. She is the lead scientist on the NASA Exoplanet Archive and has worked on the NASA Kepler, K2, and now TESS missions to characterize populations of exoplanets and to find and study the nearest planetary systems to Earth, systems that will be perfect for further study with the next generation of ground and space-based telescopes. This evening, they will be discussing Plate's new book, Under Alien Skies, a book John Green calls a rollicking, wondrous, and awe-inspiring introduction to the universe. In this lively, immersive adventure through the cosmos, Plate draws ingeniously on both the latest scientific research and his prodigious imagination to transport you to 10 of the most spectacular sights outer space has to offer in vivid, inventive scenes informed by rigorous science, injected with a dose of Plate's trademark humor, under Alien Skies places you on the surface of alien worlds from our own familiar moon to the far reaches of our solar system and beyond. For the aspiring extraterrestrial citizen, casual space tourist, and even the curious armchair traveler, Plate is an illuminating, always entertaining guide to the most otherworldly views in our universe. We have a lot to learn this evening, so without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is theirs. <laughs> Thank you so much, Seth. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so excited uh, to talk about this amazing book tonight. Uh, as Seth said, my name is Jesse Christensen. Uh, I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy. You guys just wish you had this in your hands, and you can have it. I think if you click the link, it's about to appear. Uh, and it was so much fun to read, Phil. I had such a good time reading it. Um, Thank you. So for folks who might not know, this is a bit of a turnabout of events for the two of us. Usually Phil is interviewing me about for something about his writing, but now I get to interview Phil. So the microphone is in the other hand. <laughs> yeah, and I've moderated you at what, twice? On oh panel? yeah, multiple, multiple panels now. twice, yeah. Now it's my job to get you to shush when we need to move on to the next question instead of vice versa. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but it's the day after your book came out. So first off, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm tired. <laughs> um, I'm okay. Uh, it's writing a book is a lot of work. It takes a long time. And then 
and then it's kind of gone, you, especially when you, you submit it to the publisher with the illustrations and then there's edits and all this stuff. And it's, it's really uh, sort of a maelstrom of work. And then, and then you're done for a long time, months and months and months. And then suddenly oh, wow. they call you back and say, yeah, they, they call you and say, you know, your book's coming out in three months and now we need a list of people to send it to and things you can do. And so now it's been uh, the past couple of weeks has been like setting up interviews and doing all that and getting this, this taken care of. So it's, it's been a lot, but it's been a lot of fun. Of course. And I hope it continues to be fun as you get to like enjoy the fact that the book is out. Uh, so let's talk about how the book came to be. Uh, you mentioned at the start of the book uh, that you originally wrote a much shorter version of the idea for Under Alien Skies for an article that you wrote um, where you go to three of the locations and this book obviously is expanded to 10 locations throughout the galaxy. But I'm guessing the ideas were spinning in your head for even longer than that. Do you remember the first time you really found yourself trying to picture what the sky would look like from a different place? Um, wow, that's, that's two different things. Um, I, I started Choose either of them to, 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 to the last part. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been doing that all my life. I, uh, you know, you and I are both uh, Star Trek nerds. And, uh, you know, I grew up watching the original series. It was kind of it was already off the air. But um, <clears throat> pardon me, my, you know, it was on endless repeats. And so I was watching TV shows like that and a bunch of other science fiction shows and movies. And so I was always sort of thinking, you know, what would it really be like to be on these places to be so cool? Um, the idea for the for the magazine article uh, uh, that was I wrote that for astronomy magazine and it was published in 2003 so it was 20 years ago it took 20 years to get this book uh, basically <laughs> out um, I had other ideas I guess that had to come out first uh, and and that was um, an interesting experience because it didn't go quite the way I, I thought it would um, I, I when I take my telescope out and and show people what the skies look like or um, giving talks and showing or just writing about Hubble Space Telescope images or whatever, the question I get all the time is, would these things really look like this if you were there? Mm -hmm. And I think, no, because you'd be dead, you know, period. And then we're done. Um, right. But in fact, you know, some of these things, yeah, you look at Saturn, you look at the moon, you look at Mars, sure, uh, they're going to look a lot like the, the photos you see, especially from spacecraft. But then you start looking at some of these other objects like like gas clouds, nebulae in space and things like that, and they don't. And that actually took a lot of work, a lot more than I expected when I first wrote this article. But then, you know, these ideas were just sort of floating around in my head. And I always wanted to write this into a book because it's the universe. It's huge. It's full of stuff. <laughs> and I wanted to write about it all. But I never I just I'm lazy. I never got around to it. And I had other books I wanted to write first and other things to do. And then um, we wound up. I was talking to my agent and we pitched this to uh, a couple of different publishers and Norton said, hey, let's go for it. And uh, then it took me two years, actually, to, to get this thing written. Turns yeah. out having a full time job and trying to write a book at the same time, a little bit tough, a little bit, yes. little bit yes. tough. But I really understand that feeling of an idea kind of bubbling to the top and getting to the point where it has to come out. Right. Like it's spent that time, yeah. you know, churning about getting maturing inside you and then finally it's like no it's ready like let's go it's, it's good it's a good time <laughs> i'm sorry i'm laughing because because it's that is a that's a good synopsis but in detail <laughs> it's a little bit different than that because you can be halfway through the book and you're writing a chapter and you're going oh god this isn't working at all this is terrible and then you realize and this this happened with uh both of my previous published books uh mm -hmm. halfway through a chapter it's like yeah this is just isn't going to happen um and so then you're in a panic it's like well now i gotta write something different in this one it was more along the lines of um what am I going to write about? There's so many things to choose from. So I had this huge list and I was crossing things off. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I want to write about asteroids, but I also want to write about comets. Should I put them together? And the answer turned out to be yes. Mm -hmm. um, and and then even, even as you're writing, you're realizing it's like, oh, this is going in a different direction than I thought it was going to go, but I like it. Um, the comet chapter, I, I had this idea in my head. And by the time I was Oh, I don't know, 2,500 words into 5,000 of that part of the chapter, I realized, yeah, this isn't going in the same direction, but I'm enjoying writing it this way. So, you know, you just, you have to, you have to be a little bit flexible and, and right. write about what's coming. 
So for folks who haven't read the book yet, Phil starts kind of locally and then moves out through for, through the solar system to the edge of the solar system and beyond. Uh, so we get to asteroids, we get to Saturn, we get to Pluto, uh, contentious, I know. Uh, but you mentioned that you had this huge list. So actually one of the questions I was curious about was what got cut? What didn't make the book that you were sad that you didn't get to write about in the end? <laughs> um, I actually covered, I think, the kind of things that were the kind, the kind of things the public wants to know about. I mean, that you want to write something mm -hmm. that your audience is going to read, but also the kind of things I really wanted to talk about. So I covered mostly everything, but there were things like, um, what does a galaxy look like when you're floating outside of it? And um, if you, one of the questions I get a lot too is, especially when I'm um, talking about other galaxies, is how do we know that we live in a galaxy? How do we know that we live in a spiral galaxy? Mm -hmm. And you know, we're inside it, and and we can't go outside of it because it's too far to go. So how do we how do we know this, and what would it look like? You know, the how we know this part is actually pretty easy, but what it would look like is actually a little bit tough, uh, tougher than I expected. I was I, and I had some notes on this, like, do I want to write about this? And then I realized I'm not 100% sure how to do this because our view from Earth is very different than it would be out in intergalactic space. There are dust clouds and things that block our view of a lot of the galaxy. And, and just figuring out, would it be brighter? Would it be dimmer? Would it be about the same? Mm -hmm. uh, and then as I was writing it, I realized it's not, I don't want to say it's not as interesting or engaging, but it's just not different enough from the pictures you see to to make me really want to write about it and i thought you know i've already got i want to write about a black hole i want to write about being in a gas cloud i want to write about uh especially i want to write about a, pl a planet around binary star around two stars that orbit each other and and then um between the time i originally thought about writing this and i wrote it red dwarfs became a thing these little tiny stars that are very cool and faint and then we find out that uh, they're really good at making planets. And it turns out these, these planets are very different. Than, it, they're reminiscent of our solar system, but very different. And as I started thinking about it more and more, I realized, oh yeah, I really wanna write about that. And that kind of threw the galaxy out and uh, near a pulsar. Like, I like uh, the idea uh, that uh, there was this like bracket where some things just like didn't make the cut. It's it's kind of like that. It's you, you know you've 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 just got so much you know you have so much room in your head. Like I can still remember my my phone number from when I was a kid, but I can't remember the name of you know somebody like a friend of mine I used to have in college. Things get pushed out and things stay in. And in this case, uh, it, the red dwarf thing. Once I realized I wanted to write about that, it pushed everything else out. That it, mm -hmm. that was the next contender. Could you talk more about your process for, you know, once you chose a place, how did you do the research? How did you put your mind there? Like, how did, how did you come up with these imagination things? That's, um, yeah, this is one of those questions. You know, how do you come up with your ideas? It's like, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm in the did shower. You, did you read a lot of academic papers or um, did you read a lot of popular science books or did you like, um, where did you go for your information? That's a good, that's a that's a good question. Um, I did read a lot of journal papers. Oh my God. Um, and <laughs> for my last book. on behalf of publishing astronomers. Yeah. Oh, and thank heavens. Let me tell you, because for my last book, uh, Death from the Skies, about astronomical disasters, um, that was when, this was in 2006 and seven when I was writing that. And so the internet wasn't what it is now. And so being able to find papers was a little bit tougher and I had to print them out. And so I had a stack of papers, you know, like this when the, when the book was done. If I had done that for this book, that stack would be, be huge. <laughs> um, it, it was mostly along the lines of, uh, you know, for some things like the moon, it wasn't that hard to, to come up with ideas because I've been a, a fan of the Apollo missions my whole life. I actually watched Apollo 15 launch when I was a wee little lad. In person? Um, yeah, we went, wow. my, my family went to Florida and we, I stood there and watched the rocket go up. Um, and so writing about the moon, uh, the idea of, you know, how would you walk on the moon? What would a habitat be like? Um, and, and a lot of that is just informed by the knowledge I've accrued over my <laughs> years of, of being an astronomer. <laughs> and also then it was like, well, I also know that, for example, um, the surface of the moon is covered with this powdery dust called regolith which is really just ground up rocks. And it's, it's, it's not like dirt. People, people call it the soil of the moon. It's like, no, soil and dirt are different. That's 
that has organic stuff in it, bacteria and everything. This is really just ground up rocks and it's mostly like volcanic ash. And you look at the stuff under a microscope and it's it's a horror show. And that, that's actually the word I used in the, in the book because it's jagged and, and spikes sticking out of it. And if that stuff gets in your lungs, it's a real problem. And if it gets into machinery, it can, it can screw it up. And it, uh, it's this really nasty stuff. So I wound up reading a lot of papers about you know, what are the effects of that? How can we use it? There's, there are these um, ideas now, it's mostly coming from the European Space Agency and groups over there that are figuring out ways of, of scooping this stuff up, heating it up and turning it into bricks. And then you can make it into a habitat. So yeah. you don't have to, you know, you don't have to haul your, I guess your plywood and, and sheetrock and everything <laughs> with you. You can build the materials there. So there's a lot of like just stuff I knew plus stuff I, I thought about and read about. And, and then when it came to something like planets around a red dwarf or planets orbiting a, a binary star, yeah, I had to read a lot of papers. I had an idea like the geometry of this, mm -hmm. but then thinking about the literally, how does the gravity behave? Um, how does the, you know, if you're on a, we can get to this a little bit later, but uh, if you're on a Tatooine planet, you know, Star Wars and it's orbiting binary stars, what happens to your temperature of your planet as you're going around these stars and the stars are around each other? And then I wound up doing a lot of math. A lot of math. <laughs> I, I actually, I really, I really appreciated the parts where you like step by step worked out what the seasons would be for these multi star systems. It got you like that part? Yes, no, I enjoyed it. it I, was like, I was worried about that because it, it's, it's, it, it's like, is this too much detail? Oh, I don't know. Not because for me. <laughs> it's weird, but it's kind of cool. It's like, you know, if, if you have a planet, uh, let me back up. If you have two stars orbiting each other um, and you're orbiting both of them, so you have, it's what's called a circumbinary planet. It's a lot like orbiting one star, but a little different. I mean, you're, you're orbiting both of these stars at the same time. So you can still have seasons, you have a day and a night, um, but there are weird things to see. I mean, if you think of Luke Skywalker standing on Tatooine with the wind going through his hair and, he's, and the French horns are playing in the background uh, in Star Wars, that scene was pretty accurate that was really quite good how that how that was set up but there's another kind of and, binary and, system and i want to point out 20 years before we'd found any planets around other stars george right. lucas is already like hey what if there was one around two stars Amazing. and that came out in 77 i think yeah um, so yeah incredible. it was a long time ago um there's another kind of binary system well it's, it's, it's you still have two stars orbiting each other but this time they're really far apart so you have a planet orbiting one of those stars while the two stars are going around each other. And it turns out that's really different because you can have uh, your seasons and everything like normal, except that over the course of the year, that other star that's orbiting around the star that you're going, you're orbiting around can be up at say midnight uh, sometimes for some part of the year. And other times it's up at noon. And so you have two stars in the sky, two suns in the sky. And sometimes, you know, your sun sets and then the other one rises. And that means you don't have nighttime for a long time. And as I sat down and tried to figure that out, um, yeah, it became a whole thing. And I had to have <laughs> diagrams for it. And I thought, the you diagrams know, are even... helpful. yeah, the diagrams are great by Chris Jones, my illustrator. Uh, and, and he did a really good job. We had to go back and forth with this a lot. And oh my God, was I panicked about that. Like I had to check it over and over and over again. Like, okay, so it's, 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 spring and your your the sun your primary sun is rising your secondary sun rises at midnight and i have to make sure oh oh and i i just i panic about details like that all the time I, right and hopefully well, hopefully it was correct yeah uh i didn't double check but it read fine um <laughs> but like here where we have the the months have the almanacs like the flower moon and the wolf moon and the harvest moon you could imagine like if you were an exoplanet orbiting uh, in one of these double star systems you can't just have four seasons right you have to have like the double summer the spring summer the etc cetera, etc cetera. you've got these right, hybrid yes. and, seasons and and um it, it it's it was interesting thinking about that because you could you could tell your seasons by the other star. If the other star sets when your star rises, you could call that the first day of fall or whatever. Um, and I talk about I talk about how astronomers talk about this when they're when they're together in the sky. That's called a conjunction. When they're opposite each other in the sky, that's opposition. So I use those terms to talk about the seasons. But you know that's one kind of season. But if you're thinking about seasons, seasons like spring and summer and winter. 
yeah, your planet could be tilted and you'd have seasons just like Earth does, but that might not relate to when the other star is in the sky. And that's where I just kind of said, yeah, to heck with this. You know, that's just <laughs> going to be a, that's a disaster. If you, if you have a calendar and you're living on a planet like that, I'm going to leave that to you because I don't want to try to have to figure that out. <laughs> right. Well, and one of the things I liked about that section is the way you're imagining you know, what life is like on one of these planets. So for instance, one of the things you talk about is tidally locked planets. So the planets that are orbiting the small red stars always have one side of the planet facing the star and one side facing away. And whenever we talk about these as potentially habitable planets, there's always this pushback, but like, how could life survive on a tidally locked planet? It's always daytime on one side and always nighttime on the other. And I'm always like, imagine if you were life evolving on the day side of one of these planets and you were looking at this planet that's revolving and every 24 hours as it's going around its star with these massive temperature swings and illumination swings that sounds crazier than just hey the temperature and the light is always the same go go bananas evolve do what you want to do like it's it's truly alien right and i was thinking that when i when i wrote that chapter um because if you look at earth and you say Oh my gosh, I mean, a quarter of the atmosphere is made of oxygen, which is a highly reactive molecule. It's terrible to have around and water. Oh my gosh, water is a mess. It dissolves things and it's, you know, and it freezes and expands and it's such a, it's, it's a disaster for life. But in fact, you know, life evolves to the conditions you have there. And these planets that, uh, that only, it, these, these tidally locked planets, uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, this idea, you're familiar with uh, at least the overarching concept because the moon is tidally locked to the earth. And I'm talking to the audience here, not not you, Jesse. I'm sure you're familiar with I'll take with a drink while you do that. The moon, um, because of the way the gravity of the moon and the earth have interacted over their lifetimes, the moon spins once for every time it goes around the earth. And so it's always showing the same face to the earth. Um, and planets can do this when they orbit stars as well. And so you have one side which is perpetually daylight and one side is perpetually night. And it turns out, um, yeah, that can be a problem if you're close into the star, you don't have an atmosphere, say, then one side of the planet gets infernally hot and the other side is incredibly cold. But if it has an atmosphere, the heat from the day side can then flow around. You have always, it's sort of always windy on this planet because the, the hot air rises on the day side and then flows around to the night side that cools off well, it warms up the, the night side and then that cooler air flows back to the day side and cools it off. So it may not be as bad as all that. Uh, and when I talk about uh, this planet orbiting this red dwarf star, it's called Trappist-1. And it was, it's a near, it's, the star is a real star. It's only 40 light years away. It's quite close. Uh, and it's, it's so faint though, you need a huge telescope just to see it at all. These stars are really dim bulbs. Um, but I had this idea of, you know, you land on this planet and what do you see? And it's like, well, the sun is always there. It's just there. That's where it is in the sky. It never rises and never sets. And it's always windy. There's always wind blowing in one direction because the wind is blowing from the day side to the night side. And where uh, the Terminator is, the, the line between day and night, um, you, the temperature drops so much. You have this moist air coming from the day side, cooling off on the night side it's gonna be perpetually stormy there too. And so, you know, I'm not a meteorologist, I'm not a climatologist, but that just seems kind of logical. And, uh, you know, and I bet that's gonna be at least an idea of what these planets are really gonna be like. And when you get into the details, of course, it's gonna be a mess. If they have oceans or continents, it's gonna change all that. But it was fun to just imagine that and think, what's this, what is this gonna be like for real? And, um, uh, uh, something that occurred to me that I, it, it just occurred to me. I'd never thought about it before, but a sky, the sky on that planet, if you have a planet that's just like earth, but it's orbiting a red dwarf, the sky won't be blue because there's no blue light coming from the star to light up the sky and make it blue. So the sky is going to look very dark. It might look red maybe, um, but more, more likely even during the day, it's going to be black. And it's not because there's no air. It's just that there's no blue light coming from that star. And I thought, I don't, I've never, seen that displayed in, in an article, a book, a TV show, nothing. And mm-hmm. I thought that's pretty interesting. And I, and it was kind of fun to write about that too. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, speaking of Trappist One, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book was that you didn't just take us to special places 
you took us to special places at special times when things would happen that we don't see from Earth. Uh, so Trappist One had this really cool example. Do you want to talk us through something you would see from the planets of Trappist One that we wouldn't see from Earth? I'm thinking you mean of the, the double transiting? The double transit, just super cool. Yeah, this, so so you've got this little dinky red dwarf star, and it has seven planets orbiting it. And so they all orbit in the same plane, kind of like our solar system does. All the planets orbit roughly in the same plane. If you saw the solar system from the side, it would look like uh, it would look flat, and all the planets would orbit together. It's the same thing for Trappist One, and in fact, that's how we discovered these planets. Um, we happened to see those planets orbiting edge on, and so once in orbit, they pass directly in front of their star. And we don't see the planets, but there's a dip in the starlight. It gets a little bit dimmer. And, and that's how they were discovered. So um, if you were on one of these planets, let's say planet E, which is, let's see, a B, C, D, E, the fourth planet out from the star. I have to count on my fingers to do that. We, do we name the planets in order of discovery, but in this case for TRAPPIST-1, they were, they were discovered in order from inside out. So the innermost planet is B, the next one is C, D, E, F, G, an H. I think I got that right. Um, <laughs> yes. And so if you're on planet E, B, C, and D can all transit the star from your viewpoint. So these are like mini eclipses. And I talk about that as you're, as you're approaching the system, you see the transits, you see these planets passing in front of the star. But then when you're on the planet, you see it as well. And it happens a lot because these planets, to be warm, well, let me rephrase that. These planets happen to be huddled very close to the star. And if you have a planet that's going to be Earth-like, it has to be close to that star because that star is very cool and faint. So it has to be closer to be able to get the heat to keep it warm. And so these, these planets orbit the star in a matter of like hours and days. So you will see these transits happening all the time, including sometimes you'll see two of them passing in front of the star at the same time. And it was so much fun to think about that, this is so different than what we see from Earth. Mercury wow. and Venus can, in fact, pass in front of the sun, but they're rare events, especially a Venus transit. That doesn't happen very often at Has all. Has there been a double transit of Mercury and Venus? Like, I, you know, in there has been. History? Like, it should technically have happened. I read about this, and it's extremely rare, and I can't remember the timing, but it's like it's like every, you know, it's 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 on the order of thousands and thousands of years, if not right. longer. So it was a long, long time ago. But okay. yeah, Mercury and Venus could technically, I think, could could transit the sun at the same time. Um, Venus, the geometry is a little weird because of the mm -hmm. tilts of our orbits and all kinds of stuff. So it happens, it happens every like a hundred and eight years or something like that. But mm -hmm. then two of them happen. Yeah, in, they happen in pairs. They happen in pairs, eight years apart, and then 120 yeah. years between them or something like that. Yeah. Um, but well, it, but I just on Trappist... love this description of Trappist-1, where it's like truly alien in the sense, so for us, the sun moves and the planets kind of really slowly move. But if you were on Trappist-1, the sun stays still and the planets are all moving back and forth. Like just, yeah, it's, totally, it, it's the opposite and such, an, such a weird idea. I You know, I should probably, when I do these video talks, I should probably have my notes from when I was writing this chapter, because I have all these diagrams of like how far out from the star they can get. And I, I was doing, I, I did it all by math first. I know how big the orbits are, so I can calculate using trigonometry what they look like. But then it's like, great, I have these numbers, but I have no idea if I did the math right. So that what I would do is I would draw things out to scale and check it and make sure it was right. And, it, and you know, some of these transits, it's not just like a dot moving in front of the star. It's actually big. The yeah. star is small. And the, and the next planet in is big enough and close enough that it actually blocks out a lot of the star's light. So, it, yeah, you know, the, the star is always in the same part of the sky with the planets going around it. And you see these eclipses all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and just even thinking about that was totally wild. And one of the things I really, really, really wanted to get across in this book is that these places are real. Now, I, I, I pretend that we're in a spaceship going through a gas cloud or near a black hole and stuff like that, but I based it all on real objects. And in this case, I'm writing about Trappist-1, a star we have discovered with planets we have discovered. And I did all the math according to the numbers that we have, which are pretty good about the sizes and distances of these planets. And so it reads like science fiction, but this is a very real place. And um, you're the keeper of the exoplanet database. Uh, the queen of the database. Mm -hmm. um, 
we've discovered how many planets now or have been uh, confirmed? 5,332, and tomorrow it'll be 5,339. Right, right? That's a lot. That's a lot of um, planets. And how many of them orbit um, binary stars, for example? Yeah, so I just checked this today. It's 483. So nearly 10% of the planets we found uh, are orbiting stars where they're, either, where they're either orbiting the two stars close together and they're going around, which is the circumbinary situation you talked about, or they're orbiting one star in a multi-star system. And I'm not just talking about two stars. There's systems of three and four and more stars, hierarchical systems. Right, so cool. al almost 10% of all the planets we've discovered and i don't know if there are effects because i don't know if that, that there, that there is... are it is harder to find them around multiple stars for various reasons so that's I, a lower okay. limit the actual real numbers of the real planets in the galaxy is higher than 10 percent. so okay that's what i would have figured because just because of the way we observe them right but in fact the nearest exoplanets in the entire universe to earth to the sun are in a trinary star system. They're orbiting the star Proxima Centauri, which is a red dwarf orbiting two more, more or less sun-like stars. So you have these two stars going around each other, a red dwarf going around that pair, and at least two planets orbiting that red dwarf and maybe a third, but it's super, super hard to detect those planets. So again, you know, these binary star systems I wrote about, these are real. There are real planets orbiting these stars. So over and over again, I just kept thinking as I was writing this, I'm making this stuff up based on really good science, but these places are very real. And so for me, what I really wanted people to understand is, yes, they're real, but also to immerse the reader in this experience. So it's not just like um, on the moon, it gets very hot, it gets very cold, you know, and the sun, you know, the day takes, you know, the sun rises and sets, it takes two weeks and all that kind of stuff. I really wanted to be like, you are here. And, and you look around and what do you see? What do you feel? What do you experience? And that part of it for me was the really, really fun to write. I guess I'm a frustrated science fiction writer. Uh, <laughs> and so being able to do that really satisfied this need I had to like, to, to be a Star Trek fan fiction writer or something like that and say, here we are, you know, what, what's it gonna be like? Right, well, so for all of the Hollywood script people out there, contact Phil, he's got ideas for you. Um, so I know you were yes, trying to talk about what's in the, what in the book is real. Uh, so for people who might not know, uh, Phil, a lot of your early science communication career was based on debunking things that weren't real. Um, so was there anything, were you, was this book an excuse to set the record straight on anything in particular for you? Were there any like pervasive misconceptions that you were like, no, we're going to get it right? Um, not as such. I mean, my first book, was called bad astronomy and it was debunking a lot of stuff about that and in this case it wasn't i, I didn't really set out to do that um i the one thing that springs to mind is the idea that if you're standing on the moon and it, this is an old idea because the moon is tidally locked to the earth and spins once for every orbit the earth is sort of nailed to the sky wherever you are on the moon if you can see the earth in the sky, that's where it always is. You know, it's that direction. And it turns out that's not really true because the moon's orbit is elliptical and tilted with respect to earth's equator. And so it actually, um, because of uh, perspective and things, we can actually from earth see a little bit onto the far side of the moon in, in every direction, north, south, east, and west, depending on where it is in its orbit. And what that means if you're standing on the moon is that the earth is actually going to move in the sky and um so so that was sort of a it's not like people walk around thinking well i guess if i were on the moon the earth would always look in the same spot in the sky nobody <laughs> thinks that right but it's sort of this idea that's pervasive amongst science communicators and astronomers and it's not right and as i thought about it and i started i started <laughs> started doing the math and I thought, okay, well, the moon does this and this, and how, how much would the earth move? And then I realized, oh, this math is super hard, a <laughs> lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And um, I wound up going and using planetarium software and say, okay, I'm on the moon, show me the earth. And the earth moved a lot. And it was like 15 degrees, which oh, yeah. is- That's a big chunk you know, of sky. It's like bigger than your fist. When you hold your fist out like that. So the earth isn't just sitting there, it's actually making this complicated elliptical motion. Mm -hmm. And that really surprised me. I didn't think it was going to be anywhere near that much. And then I realized after I did that, oh, that means that if you're in the right spot on the moon, you can see the Earth rise and set over the course of the, a lunar orbit one month. Mm -hmm. 
And so I put that in the book and it's like, that wasn't something I set out to do. But once I saw that it was a thing that actually happened. And again, it was one of those things where it's like, that's so weird. I had to check it like five different ways, but it, I always wound up with the same numbers. So I thought, okay, this must be real. Right. And it's like, that's pretty cool. That'd be a really fun vacation spot. You'd go to the moon for a couple of weeks it's and watch awesome. the earth slowly rise and slowly set over the horizon. That'd be, that'd be pretty awesome. Yeah. I liked the, I liked the vacation destination recommendations for, you know, for some time in the future when we have comfortable, safe, faster than light travel. <laughs> yeah. The that's... I was, sorry. The reason I was asking about um, the, uh, you know, setting the record straight. One of the things that I read in the book that genuinely surprised me was if you were standing on an asteroid in the asteroid belt, you wouldn't be able to see any other asteroids. Uh, like I'd literally never thought about it. Like, and I know that everybody thinks the asteroid belt is super crowded and you've got all these, you know, science fiction shows of ships like dodging through the debris, but I'd never thought about the fact that it is so empty. If you're standing on an asteroid, you can't see any other asteroids. That really, I, I like genuine shock there. Yeah. The, um, there are so many asteroids. I mean, we already know of of uh, something like a million uh, that yeah. orbit the sun between like Mars two. and Jupiter. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, and those are the ones we know. Exactly. And of course, we've, we've discovered all the big ones. And so the ones we're finding these days are smaller, uh, a few miles across or less. And um, if you talk about how many there are, you have to define how many are there bigger than a certain size. So how many are how many of them are there bigger than say 100 meters across the size of a football field say and it turns out there are a billion a billion of them bigger than 100 meters across. This is such a huge number and you think they you know it must be like empire strikes back when the millennium falcon is is you know shucking and jiving in between these things to get away from the tie fighters and it turns out no it's not like that at all because these things are small and that is a lot of real estate out there and it turns out that um if you do the math, uh, yeah, uh, you can stand on the surface of an asteroid and look up in the sky and there won't be a single one visible to the naked eye. That's not always the case. I mean, you may you may be near enough one, but in general, on mm -hmm. average, yeah, they're really far apart. I wrote about that in my first book um, uh, because I was talking to a friend of mine who studies asteroids about that and he told me that and I couldn't believe it. And then I thought about it some more and just did, you know, kind of really like high school level math and went, oh yeah, that's right. They're really far apart. And I did it again to make sure because you never know. I may have screwed something up in my first book, but it's I like, feel like no. instead of a sightseer's guide to the universe, the, the subtitle should be filled in the math. Yeah. Well, yeah, don't trust my math because believe me, <laughs> um, I found I, I I did for the bi for the binary star uh, uh, planet. And if the if the two stars um, if you're if you're on a binary star planet going around both stars, the stars are going around each other too. And so every now and again, one star will block the other one. And when that happens, you're not getting any lighter heat from the star, which means your temperature is going to drop. And I thought, well, how much? How much is it going to drop? 20 pages of algebra later, uh, and I had I finally had the right answer because I screwed up that math at first. I used some some math I knew from graduate school, got the wrong answer. I just like this. I know this can't be right and had to back out of those equations and derive them from first principles, which is not something I've done for 20 years mm -hmm. until I finally figured out what I was doing. And so, yeah, that would have oh taken gosh, me a beat as well. <laughs> what a nightmare. But it, but, you know, and, and now you have the answer. Yeah. And I spent hours, you know, over a course of days figuring this out. And it's like two paragraphs in the book. <laughs> but those paragraphs are good. But you did the math so that we don't have to. So right, we exactly. Just, we just get to read the answer and go, huh, and then keep going. Pretty much. Yeah. And that happened a lot <laughs> for this book. It, it, some of the things were so strange. Like um, if you land on a rubble, uh, these small asteroids that, that we visit are oh not gosh. solid rocks. The scene you know, where the person how... just goes into the into the yeah, I know. And it was like, <laughs> and I had this idea. Well, let me let me back up a little bit. I know mm -hmm. we don't have a huge amount of time, so I'll try to I'll talk a little bit more quickly. So, um, when I was a kid, we thought that asteroids were like these giant solid rocks, like like a rock you'd find in your garden, but they're not. They're actually the the little ones are rubble piles. They're basically collections of of zillions of rocks held together by their own gravity. And it's not 100% clear why that is. It could be that these things suffer impacts that crack them. And over time, they just crack all the way through. Sometimes they get hard, hit hard enough to basically explode, but then their gravity pulls all the stuff back together again. So it's just, it's just a rubble pile. But the thing is, in a lot of cases, these rocks are so fragile 
that if you know, even though some of them are huge, we see on the surface of these asteroids, something like the size of a house, if you had that rock on the Earth, it would collapse under its own weight. They're very friable, as geologists say. You could just crush them in your hand. And so if you tried to step onto the surface of an asteroid, these rocks would crush underneath you, and you could actually uh, fall into the asteroid. Not because of the gravity, but if you like jumped from your spaceship and tried to land on, on this thing with, on your own two feet, you could just fall into the asteroid. And we saw one of our spacecraft do this. It was getting up to the asteroid to get a sample to return to Earth, and it actually buried itself um, about, about half a meter, about 18 inches into that asteroid before it stopped and pulled itself out. And I don't think anybody was expecting that. I think they thought it was just going to touch the surface and bounce off, and it didn't. And if it hadn't have basically used jets to puff gas out and blow itself in the other direction, it just would have gone straight into that, into that asteroid. And I had, so I had to write about this and, uh, and talk about trying to visit an asteroid and actually falling in and getting stuck right. in there. <laughs> Um, all right, I, as you mentioned, we're starting to run short on time, so I want to make sure we have time to get to questions from the audience. So please, if you have questions for Phil, uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, I really like this first one because it's going to give us a chance to talk about something we both enjoy talking about. Uh, Philip asks, why is the sky red on Vulcan? Well, Vulcan's not a real planet. Um, and, but it's a planet that we love. Yeah, it's a planet that we love. And for a while, we thought it was a real planet because um, a planet had been discovered around the star that is canonically Vulcan star in Star Trek. Uh, and I was, we're all very excited about this. Uh, but then just a couple of months ago, a paper came out basically saying, yeah, no, it's not real. It is a, an artifact of the way it was imaged or observed. So that was a sad, sad point. But the sky color depends on a lot of stuff. It can depend on the color of the star. It can depend on what's in your atmosphere, like gases, like we have nitrogen in our atmosphere. That's really good about taking the blue light from the sun and sending it all over the sky so that everywhere you look, you're seeing blue light coming at you. But on Mars, for example, um, there's a lot of red dust in the air. It's literally rust. It's iron oxide, and it's very, very fine uh, powdery particles that float in the air of Mars and it tints the sky red. And uh, there's also another effect, and I talk about this in the book, because our sky is blue during the day, and then when the sun sets, various physical things go on that make the sky look red, make the sun look red when it's setting. But on Mars, it's the opposite. This dust makes the sky look red during the day, but when the sun is setting, it's actually, that dust is really good about sending that blue light toward you. And so the sky around the setting sun looks blue. And you can see this in photographs taken by rovers on the planet. Uh, and so it's the opposite of Earth. And it, you know, it could be the same with Vulcan. Vulcan in the TV show is very hot. It's probably got a lot of desert. And so maybe there's a lot of dust suspended in its atmosphere. And that's why the sky is red. So there you go, just like Mars. <laughs> or you talked about Titan in the book as well, which, uh, you know, there it's Tholans making the skies look, you know, a darker orangey reddish color rather than iron. Right. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. It's the only moon in the solar system that has a, a thick atmosphere. It's mostly nitrogen. But um, the sunlight hits uh, uh, these, these molecules of, of methane and stuff like that in Titan's atmosphere, breaks them down, and then they reform into more complicated molecules. And a lot of these things are red or brown or yellow and uh, Titan looks really orange from a distance and if you were on the surface and looking up the sky would be sort of a dull yellowish orange color so yeah that's a good point it just depends on, on what you're seeing what what's in that atmosphere and when you look back like you mentioned watching the original series it's amazing how many fictional planet surfaces just look like southern California with a slightly different filter on the lens, right. just his green and his slightly purple and his slightly orange. They're alien, but yeah, and I remember the skies are all one, different colors. I remember one episode that had a green sky, and I, when I was a kid, I thought, "Well, that's silly." And now I'm like, I don't know what would make a green sky now as a scientist, but I wouldn't discount it because heaven knows nature seems to be a lot more clever than we are, and uh, just even in our own solar system, stuff is so weird that you never know what you know what might actually be going on out there. Yeah, well, I mean, that was actually one of the questions I had, uh, which was, you know, now that we've discovered all of these planets around other stars, one of the things we're discovering is how different they are from the planets of our solar system, like in different sizes and configurations and temperatures and around different kinds of stars. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to describe, like, since your career has spanned before the discovery of exoplanets <laughs> through to 
the discovery of thousands of exoplanets, like how that's changed your perception of us and our place in the galaxy. Hey, you kids these days always had planets on other stars. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was in graduate school work, just starting to work on my PhD with Hubble when the first planets were discovered around other stars. And I had, I had already gotten my PhD in 94, I can't remember what year it was. And when, and, and, and a year later, planets were discovered around stars more like the sun. Uh, and as, as we started defining more, I mean, that was such a huge thing. And you, you read books about big discoveries in astronomy. We've discovered the universe is expanding and all this stuff. And you don't really know what it's like to live through a revolution like that. And for this one, um, it was amazing because we didn't know if planets orbited other stars and then all of a sudden we found them and to 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 see astronomers yelling at each other these aren't real <laughs> or you know it could be this could be that and nobody really knows and then and then um, uh, I won't go into the details but uh, you can read about this in history books now, but I remember just hearing about it from somebody saying, oh yeah, they, they, you know, they, they confirmed a transit of a planet around another star right when it was predicted. And it was like overnight, everybody was like, oh yeah, these are, these are real, these are planets. And then to realize that they're around stars that we can see. Um, some of the first planets found are around stars bright enough that you can see them with even binoculars of the naked eye. And then I realized it's like you could use an off the shelf telescope, you could like order a telescope, a small, you know, backyard telescope and a camera and detect these planets Now your detection wouldn't be that great, but you would be able to see it. Mm -hmm. And that to me blew my mind it's like these, these have been hiding in plain sight forever. <laughs> and then it just it just happened to be that we started to discover them and then everybody realized they're everywhere and, and we could have been spotting them this whole time. Right. So, I did I did laugh at some, I think I actually took a picture of the line in the book where you're like, transits are easy. It's so easy to find. Like I spent my entire PhD trying to find transiting planets and failed from the ground through the atmosphere with the sun rising and setting every day. It is you're just not very good at this. I'm sorry to tell you this, but you yeah. know, if you had just I'm bought an eight inch it. telescope, uh, no, I mean, of, of course it's, it's, it's hard to do if you're doing it there in, in, if you're looking at faint stars or planets that are too small. I mean, there's a million reasons this is hard, but for those first planets that we found and, and, we observed one with Hubble and it was this beautiful, we got this gorgeous graph out of it. It was so perfect and smooth and lovely. And then somebody, somebody actually posted one on the internet that they'd taken from their backyard with a small telescope. And it, you know, it was ratty and noisy and everything, but it was there, you yeah. could see it. And to me, that was just, that's the part that just to totally destroyed me. Right. Uh, it's, it's well, and for everybody on the line, if you have a telescope, there are ways that you can get involved in helping us confirm planets but, you know, for instance, the NASA test mission is finding right now, there's this huge network of ground-based amateur astronomers with their backyard telescopes who are able to do this, who are able to take these really simple measurements. But, you know, we need the complementarity of like the space and the ground to actually confirm these planets. So if you have a telescope and any of this sounds exciting, there are ways to get involved. Uh, I have another question from the chat from Christopher. On a spinning planet, what limits the height of mountain ranges other than geological factors? Does planetary spin encourage higher mountains? Ooh, that's an interesting question. And I've never thought of that before. Um, but okay, in general, it's not that big of an effect. Um, you're, you're, you're talking about um, mountain building and I can, I can see the Rocky Mountains out my window here. They get so tall because of two things, basically gravity if the gravity is too strong, you just can't make big mountains and the structural strength of the material the mountains built out of. So on Earth, you can, you know, granite, which is, you know, not the strongest mineral, but tough enough. You can have mountains that get to be several miles high on Pluto, where the gravity is lower and water freezes so solid, it's actually harder than granite. You can have mountains that tall made out of water ice. But on Earth, you can't do that because the ice just isn't strong enough to support its own weight. Now, if the planet is spinning very, very rapidly, there's this force outward, this centrifugal force, if you want to call it that. There's a lot of different ways you can calculate that. Um, and yeah, if the planet's spinning really, really fast, that sort of counteracts gravity. And so you could have mountains that are taller than that. Uh, 
uh, the, the limiting factor would be if you're spinning so rapidly that stuff starts to fly off the mountains. You have negative gravity on the planet. And if you go to a, 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 a carnival, a, a, a fair, a circus, whatever it is where you can get on the, on the rides mm -hmm. and you can go in the spinny wheel and stuff like that. And it's spinning so rapidly that even as, if the wheel starts to tilt up, you're still plastered to the outside of that wheel or the, well, you know, you're on the inside. You're, you feel this force outward that's stronger than gravity because you don't fall. It's, it's the same thing. So if you had a planet spinning fast enough, yeah, you could have mountains uh, bigger than that. But I have a feeling there would be other problems with earthquakes and your atmosphere flying away. I'd have to think about that, but that's it really cool. Sounds like you'd have to do some math. Yes, sadly. And I have done stuff like this before because there are stars, neutron stars, for example, very dense, very small kinds of stars that spin incredibly rapidly. And they actually, they're, they actually can distort and get egg shaped because of this. And uh, they can only spin so fast before flying apart. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do see things like that, but I, you know, I don't know if planets can even spin that fast. It'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, I mean, we, I don't think we've seen, we haven't been able to measure the sphericity of rocky planets you know, close enough to see that yet. We see it with gas giants, for instance, when gas giants are oblate, they're, you know, a bit fatter at the equator than at the poles yeah. because they're spinning and they're made of gas, but that's not rocky planets and mountains. Right. And Saturn is noticeably flattened. You can see it in pictures if you look at it. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, I, I should say there are asteroids that do spin that fast. Um, complicated, we don't have time, but it's complicated, but asteroids can spin faster and faster and faster over time. And if they spin too fast, stuff off the surface starts flying off. And that, that basically steals some of the spin and it slows the asteroid down. So we do find a lot of asteroids, small ones. self-limiting, like you get yeah. to a certain point, you can't go any faster. Yeah, and that's called the breakup speed. And we do find a lot of asteroids that are very close to that speed, which means this is happening. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I have another question from the chat uh, from an anonymous attendee who says, what's the latest and or most interesting about the search for signs of life on exoplanets? About the, about searching for life? Yeah. What's, what's the most interesting? Um, we haven't found it yet. I think that's probably the, uh, the thing. Um, we don't know what's going on with these planets orbiting other stars. Um, but what's happening, we're, we're looking for planets by we, I mean, you know, Jesse, not me. I just write about what she does. Um, but we're looking for planets that are like earth orbiting, um, the right distance from their star so that they can have liquid water on their surface. For example, if they have an atmosphere and water, um, but it's hard to do that. We're, it's sort of the cutting edge of what we can do. We can barely tell that some of these planets have atmospheres and sort of what's in them in general. Uh, so, you know, being able to spot oxygen in the atmosphere of another planet is very tough. You know, the JWST, the new telescope, may be able to detect that in some planets, um, and we'll see. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of observations going on right now to look for that. So, yeah. so anything the, the I say hottest, about that may be obsolete in a week. Right. The hottest off the press JWST result right now is that TRAPPIST-1b, which is the closest of those seven rocky planets to the star, does not seem to have an atmosphere. Uh, they they were able to get an emission spectrum of it. It just looks like bare rock. Uh, but actually, yes. but of the seven, that was the one that was least likely to have an atmosphere because it's so close to the star that it's like you know holding up a hair dryer to this planet. <laughs> so it wasn't expected to have an atmosphere, and it doesn't. So we're still holding out hopes for like B, uh, C and D and E that they might have atmospheres, but not yet. Right. And I had a moment of panic. I mean that 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 paper came out a month ago or less. And I had a moment of panic. It's like, oh God, what did I write in the book? <laughs> it's flipping through the book, you know, because I had an advanced copy. It's like, we're printed. This is done. Yeah. And it turns out I said it probably doesn't have an atmosphere. So I, was, I, I saw was that. Okay. I was like, yeah, um, well done. But it, I, I think right now for looking for life, um, our own solar system is is more interesting because we can we can explore it more thoroughly. And so we're looking at um, oceans of water under the surfaces of icy moons, Saturn, Jupiter, even Uranus, Neptune's moons, even Pluto might have liquid water under its surface. And of course we have uh, the Perseverance rover on Mars looking for maybe, it's not designed to look for signs of life, but it's kind of looking for the right environments and future missions that are planned to look for life on, on Mars that may have existed billions of years ago. And I think that's, we're probably gonna learn a lot more about that sort of thing before we learn about what's going on with exoplanets. And I may be totally wrong here, uh, you know, we may launch a huge telescope in the next 20 years that that finds, you know, uh, uh, Proxima Centauri B has has an oxygen atmosphere. That would be amazing. Well, C maybe. I think that's the right distance. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, 
it's, 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 all of this is cutting edge. And the answer is we don't know. We don't know what's going on out there, but we may very soon. And that's, that's the cool thing. Yeah, that's very exciting. Uh, I'm told we have time for one more question. So I'll okay. ask this one and you can, you can just yes or no this one. Uh, do you anticipate that we'll find Earth-like planets? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's just statistics. I mean, we've, we've hardly started looking and we found over 5,000 planets. And, a lot, and they're so weird. There's such a weird diversity of gigantic planets like Jupiter orbiting really close to their sun, planets that are in between the size of, of Earth and Neptune, and we don't even have planets like that in our solar system. Um, they have atmospheres that are very different. And the thing is, we have found, and I don't know how many, you might know, Jesse, that are the size of Earth orbiting at that right distance from their star. Uh, and we don't know if they have atmospheres, we don't know if they're Earth-like, um, but they could be. And uh, the fact of the matter is, especially around red dwarfs, which are the most common star in the galaxy, 70% of all stars are these little red dwarfs. And it looks like um, there's been a couple of papers that just came out that show that pr pretty much every red dwarf that we look at has planets and has more than one planet. And so just looking at the numbers, you're talking about probably over a trillion planets in our galaxy alone. The odds of there not being another Earth-like planet out there seem to be pretty slim to me. So I would bet, oh yeah, there are going to be other ones. We'll find them. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, that has to be the end of our chat. Uh, thank you so much uh, for chatting to us, Phil, about your new book, Under Alien Skies. Under the Alien link Skies. is in the chat. Uh, Seth probably will do some mop-up, but it was really great to chat, Phil. Congratulations. Thank you so much for doing this with me, Jesse. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's always nice to see you. Yeah. Thank you both again for your time. You know, this has been a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot. And yeah, like she said, the, the link to the book is in the chat. Um, you know, on behalf of Harvard University Division of Science, the Harvard Library and the Harvard Bookstore, um, we hope you have a great night and we hope to see you at our next event. And to the person who asked in the questions whether or not this will be available, um, this should be on our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. Um, so thank you all. Um, and thank you both for your time. Have a nice night. Thank you, Seth. And thanks everybody for watching. Yeah. Bye folks. Bye.